Hey guys, it's Miracle Max here. Sorry if I sound like death warmed up, but that's exactly how I feel. Got the flu and it just won't let go. Anyway, the show must go on. I've got a Mazda 626 2002 model with the alternator light on. Let's check it out. started off as a intermittent fault has become a regular fault now so if we start it up you can see or before we start it up you can see the um, alternator light is on and that's exactly how it's meant to be that indicates that the brushes are going through the rotor and that the rotor is in in a uh, closed circuit condition let's have a look when we actually start it up okay the light goes out no problems that's good isn't it but notice it comes back on after a very short period of time and it stays on. Okay, let's head under the bonnet. I recently bought one of these Autol BT360 battery testers. They're actually not too bad. I think I paid about 60 odd bucks for it from China. They seem to work okay. I just put it through its paces. So you go into enter, English, Spinglish, Spanglish, in vehicle, before charge, regular flooded, so it's a leaded one. The CCA in this particular case is um, 6.30, so that's set up correct, and we enter on that. Okay, it's saying it's a good battery. The reason being is this is a brand new one. I've had to replace the other one. The other one was Crook. Um, that gives us a bit of an indication that uh, obviously there's more um, to be blamed than just the battery here. We can also go further with this particular battery because we can do a starter motor check. We'll just try that next. So it's saying the cranking is okay. So we can get, actually go on to a charging test next, which is what we're interested in. A loaded testing, so I'll put the uh, headlights on. We'll bring the revs up. So notice what it says there, no output whatsoever. Not happy jam, all right? So that's what we're gonna look at next. Why has it got no output whatsoever? In line with the motto of keeping things simple, um, we need to check our battery terminals, make sure there's no corrosion, and um, make sure that they're tight. Now I've done that already. Um, they're clean, there's no corrosion, and they are both tight. Next step, let's have a look at some voltage drop tests. What do I mean by that? Let's have a look. There's a couple of connectors on the back of the alternator that we need to um, check. First, we need to make sure, of course, that the earth is in good condition. The battery post, which in this case goes from here to that gray connector down there, it's just a bar to make access easier. We need to make sure that we've got good uh, or no voltage drop between there and the battery. Then we've got these two connectors going into the alternator. One is our light circuit and the other one is um, a duty cycle which is pulsed from the PCM. So we'll have to have a look at those next. Let's, let's do the voltage drop first. So if we get uh, one side of our multimeter, uh, the positive lead perhaps, put it onto our multimeter onto volts as you can see there. And if we go down, believe it or not, the other side will go down to the battery post on the alternator and we need to load the circuit so it needs to be running then we can check for a voltage drop remember we should have little or no voltage drop let's check it out 20 millivolts 19 millivolts is uh, acceptable in this case so let's have a look at the earth side so I'm now on the negative battery post it'll probably read negative yes it is and as you can see down there I'm actually on to the body of the alternator with the other multimeter lead, the negative lead. So let's see what that reads. It's reading about 12.6, so in actual fact, we have no voltage drop across our positive side or negative side. Very good condition. What do we check next? Now I could uh, continue testing here at the alternator, but uh, I've done some extra testing off camera. So just to make your life a little bit easier, you can see there's a white green wire when it focuses. 
a white green wire and behind that is a white red wire. We're actually going to head to the ECU because that's where these wires come from and um, as I said I've done some testing off camera just to give you a bit of a heads up of the direction that I'm taking. According to the uh, pin out here of the ECU the alternator is number 111 and the two wires going into it, those two wires from the ECU are number 30 and number 53. We flip the page over 30 and 53 30 is alternator terminal 3 output voltage so we know that there's no voltage coming out of the alternator at this point in time don't we we're going to check that anyway uh, 30 and the other one was 53 I believe here we go alternator terminal 2 field coil control now this is a duty cycle setup as you can see here um, ignition on zero duty cycle idling 0 to 100% obviously depending on the load that's being applied with an electrical load applied it will change the duty cycle so I'm going to check it at the actual ECU um, as I said I've done a bit of uh, further investigation off camera and that's why I'm heading in that direction so we've got uh, 0.3 of a volt which is pretty much useless to us isn't it what we now need to do is have a look at pin 53 I think it was um, the white red wire and see if that's creating a duty cycle which will turn the alternator off and on creating the voltage we need. We don't have to be concerned about colour change here we've got a white red as we saw down at the alternator pin 53 as we've stated this is the fella here or the ECU is responsible for creating a duty cycle signal that will go to the rotor which will switch it off and on at the varied rate and therefore provide the voltage that the, uh, the vehicle needs to run and charge the battery of course let's have a look at that Keep in mind we need to change it to duty cycle, that's what our book says. So we're looking for a duty cycle percentage, that's how we need to measure it. As you can see we've got no duty cycle signal whatsoever coming from the ECU. I bought one of these cheap oscilloscopes, they're a DSO-138, they're quite, quite well known on the net. I built the kit myself, quite easy to put together. So you can see the signal there, there's no square wave whatsoever, um, which is what it should be, a duty cycle signal, just a random figure going past which is no good. While the evidence that I've collected seems to point toward a damaged ECU I'm not thoroughly convinced you know these new alternators that are, are controlled by the ECU are very very complex inside the ECU the switching that is done. Um, sometimes what you've got to do is go and seek help from another person that is part of the diagnostic process being willing to accept help from others. So what I'm going to do tomorrow is go and visit a place where I used to work, an auto electrician workshop, and get some advice from them. And hopefully they have one of the specialised tools that I need to test this alternator. After consultation with a local auto electrician, he suggested that the best thing to do um, was to pull the alternator off and just check it physically. He didn't have the equipment necessary. He had all the other versions except the one that suits this particular Mazda. Typical. But anyway, I physically pulled it off and isn't it always the case that when you're feeling crook the job is always bigger than it should be? Just have a look at what I had to do just to get the alternator off. So apart from the whole fun experience of doing something when you're crook, um, the alternator's tucked away up in there, not a big deal, that wasn't overly hard. But of course what was in the road, the exhaust pipe. Yes, so the front pipe had to come off as well. And of course the front bolts, these bolts on the flange, where are we? Flange bolts here. Uh, one was really, really tight, so it took quite some time to get it off. Okay, enough of the whinging. It's time to have a look at the alternator itself. Let's pull it apart. So to pull it apart, it's a matter of undoing these four bolts here. Once they're undone, um, and I've got the front housing held in the vise, just remove those, drop them on the ground apparently. We should be able to gently lever back on the um, stator and that in turn should move backwards so it's just a matter of levering in uh, you can see where the bolt went through there's a tiny little hole or the hole where the bolt went through and if you just lever on the stator a little bit that should gently move back that should leave the rotor in the housing and the whole lot should come out the back let's just gently pull that back and see what happens and ooh, that's interesting 
a look inside there you can see a lot of uh, the brushes are there they seem to be okay but uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, brush compound there for sure like um, carbon floating around boy that bearing's noisy isn't it we should be able to check the rotor at least in this particular case we'll see how that goes by using our multimeter on ohms we should have uh, continuity between those two points there which we do 3.3 ohms now if I apply power to that that should give us about oh, three to four amps of current going through that so we'll give that a shot so what I've got here is a battery just a sealed lead acid battery out of a uh, uninterrupted power supply uh, I have my current clamp here which is set ready to go on DC on amps and all I'm going to go is between generally you'll see a big blue spark like that and we're drawing almost five amps so that's that's an indication that uh, well for a start that this um, rotor the coil or the wire inside the rotor is okay there's nothing wrong with it and also that uh, it hasn't shorted out if that were the case the current would go through the roof if the uh, wiring was shorted across one another the current would go really really high so the rotor itself is fine but I'm very suspect about the electronics in the back of that one I may end up putting in another alternator I've done all the testing that I possibly can and um, I'm not throwing parts at it but sometimes you have to make a judgment call based on the information that's in front of you and that's what I'll do so unfortunately gonna have to go on perhaps a bit of experience um, it goes against my grain to actually try and replace something that I can't pinpoint exactly what the fault is I could also just replace the or well, they call it a regulator but it's bas basically a brush box with some electronics inside it could be faulty electronics um, but rather than just replace that I'm going to replace the entire alternator I believe that will be a better solution long term so I've ordered a new alternator hopefully it shouldn't be too much longer um, that'll give me a chance to fit it tonight to the vehicle and hopefully that's fixed our fault okay so I've got the exchange alternator I've decided to go that way um, important things to check before you actually fit it you don't want to fit it and find you got the wrong thing so of course the connector itself is important this is a PD design the new one and of course the old one was a PD design as well make sure that you um, uh, focus on that because the earlier model only a year or so before were a LS design which was a light and a sense wire this one is a power and a duty cycle so just be aware of those so that's correct if we flip it over this side you can see the connector is in the same position plus the uh, output terminal is in the same position another thing too to keep in mind is the amount of ribs um, that are on for the multi-rib belt so one two three four and if we compare it to our older one where are we one two three four so I feel pretty confident that that's the uh, correct alternator so time to put it on so I've installed the new alternator as you can see um, fitted in no problems whatsoever apart from the exhaust system had one bolt that was a bit dodgy I've sorted that out reconnected the battery time to turn the key and find out what happens have we fixed the fault or not as you can see this vehicle has done 242,000 kilometers so if it was an alternator it wouldn't be surprising but the only way to uh, find out if we fixed the fault is to start it let's give it a go no alternator light on our battery light it should be over there somewhere it came on when we turned the ignition on but it's gone out straight away since the ECU is still sitting on the floor it might be interesting to have a look at the duty cycle going out to the alternator um, just out of curiosity sake so of course one of the most important evidences that we've sorted the problem is if the battery has been charged we're getting 14.57 to the alternator not under load I'll just stick it under load hang on and that's now under load it dipped for half a second now it's up at 14.5 uh, so I'm pretty happy with those results the thing I did note that seemed contradictory in some of the other information that I read was this pin 30 here it says that at end engine idling it should be 14 to 16 volts note that there 
Well, let's have a look at uh, what our voltmeter is reading right now. Now this is consistent with other information that I was reading on the net. Should be about three to four volts, something along those lines. It I later found a tech tip article that was able to reinforce my diagnosis. It clearly identifies both the P and D terminals, which is great. But notice here, it states that the P terminal should have three to five volts, which is what we got in the end, not the 14 to 16 volts that the previous information or data that had been provided to me. Let's have a look at that duty cycle on pin number, what was it, 53? While it might be a little hard to understand duty cycle, we're actually looking at the distance between here and here as percentage on time. So in other words, let's say this is uh, half on and half off, that would be 50% duty cycle. Um, it's just idling at the moment, there's no real electrical loads. Let's chuck on some electrical loads and um, see what we can come up with. Just notice when this distance between here and here increases, that's the increasing of the duty cycle. So I'll now add some electrical loads and see what happens. You can clearly see now this time here between here and here is a lot longer. So in other words, the um, power going to the rotor has been increased, or the duty cycle, the amount of on time has, which will increase the overall voltage going to it. So that's the duty cycle. I'm really happy with that signal there. Even though this is a cheap little oscilloscope, it's proved the point, hasn't it? If I take off my electrical loads again, let's have a look and see what happens. Okay, it's gone back to a smaller signal here. The ECU is able to vary the duty cycle as we just saw and that will take up or compensate for the electrical loads put onto the vehicle itself. So I'm happy with that signal, it certainly proves that the ECU is okay and that the uh, alternator is responding in kind. That little oscilloscope cost me about, I think it was about, oh, I don't know, 12 bucks or maybe a fraction more but well worth the money. Um, hopefully I'll have a look at that in a later video. But quite happy with the results that I've seen out of this. I can classify this as a fix. After all that shamozzle, am I able to claim this as a diagnostic success? After all, I wasn't able to pinpoint with accuracy after all the testing I did that the alternator was the fault. Well, yes, I believe that I was successful. Part of the diagnostic process is to know when you need help from others, when you need diagnostic equipment that you don't personally have. That's why you go and look for help from others. That's why you subscribe to organizations like TAT, the Automotive Technician. I fully support them, they're great. Sometimes after all the testing that you've done, the only thing you can go on is your experience. In this particular case, the alternator is most likely the fault simply because the ECUs are very rare to play up on this particular model. The alternators do play up, however. In this case, it was a success, and I'm glad about that. But we had to do that testing anyway. It was good to see all the back testing that I had done at the ECU has now proven that the alternator was at fault. So it's really important that we follow through with our diagnostic process. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Even though it was a bit of a diagnostic challenge, we were able to come with a successful result in the end. If you did and you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. Give it a like and feel free to comment down below. Until next time, this is Miracle Max signing off. Catch you later.